Hi there. So today I'd like to talk to you about the displacement current. What is it? Where does it fit in? And all that good stuff. So I'd like you to think back and think about charging a capacitor. So let's imagine a simple RC circuit. And here you have a battery, a resistor, a capacitor, and a switch all hooked up in series. Now at time t is equal to zero, the capacitor is initially uncharged. And then you close the switch and you watch what happens. What will happen is that initially the current in the circuit will start off strong and charge will build up on the plates of the capacitor. The current though will decay in strength exponentially as the charge builds up on the plates until it reaches the max possible charge allowed by that particular capacitor hooked to that particular battery. When it does this, the maximum charge that's reached, big Q, is going to be equal to the capacitance of the capacitor times the voltage on the plates. So Q is equal to C delta V. Now, if you think about it and what's going on in between the plates of the capacitor, let's imagine a parallel plate capacitor for now, just to keep things simple. What this means is that in between the capacitor plates, there is no current flowing. You have current flowing up to the positive plate and flowing away from the negative plate as defined with current in the direction of positive charge flow, but you don't have any current between the plates, okay? And that's because in between the plates you either have a vacuum, nothing, or you have a dielectric. And dielectrics are insulators so that the capacitor doesn't get short out and then it will just blow through the capacitor like it would a regular wire. So no current in between the capacitor plates. Now, according to Ampere's law, the integral of B dot ds is equal to mu naught times I enclosed. So this would mean that in between the capacitor plates, there's no magnetic field. Because in between the capacitor plates, you can draw a little Amperean loop, for example, and it won't enclose any current. Okay? Now, in a way, this really doesn't make sense. Because you've got a magnetic field on one side of the capacitor plate, a magnetic field on the other side of the capacitor plate, and then what? There's supposed to be just no magnetic field here? That doesn't make any sense, okay? And it's also not true, right? If you put a hole probe in between the plates of a capacitor while it was charging or discharging, you would measure a magnetic field. So it turns out not to be true. So let's think about this a little more deeply. Here's a picture of what I'm talking about. Let's assume that we have some capacitor plates here, indicated in the figure on the left-hand side you have your positive plate, on the right-hand side you have your negative plate. For a charging capacitor, the current flows towards the positive plate and away from the negative plate. So this capacitor is still charging. Now here, I've drawn my Amperian loop in between the capacitor plates. And these lines indicate the electric field that's present between those capacitor plates. Remember that for a parallel plate capacitor, the electric field points straight from the positive plate to the negative plate, and the magnitude of that electric field is sigma over epsilon. Now it's epsilon not if there's nothing in between, it's epsilon if there's a dielectric. But either way, here you have sigma over epsilon. Now sigma is equal to the charge on the plates divided by the area. But let's think about this. For a charging capacitor, the charge in the plates grows exponentially, according to the equation, the charge at some time t, little q of t, is equal to the max charge, big, big Q, times 1 minus e to the minus t over rc. Okay? So you've got an increase, an exponential increase of the charge on the plates. Now, since the charge on the plates is changing in time, and the electric field is the charge per unit area divided by your constant, epsilon, right? Since that's the case, then that means that the electric field in between the plates of the capacitor is time dependent, and it starts off, of course, at zero and grows exponentially, just like the charge. So you have a time dependent electric field. So Maxwell first realized that Ampere's law was incomplete. In other words, if changing magnetic fields can introduce electric fields, then why can't changing electric fields cause magnetic fields? So what Maxwell did was he took Ampere's equation, the integral of V dot ds is equal to mu naught times I enclosed, and added a term. He modified the equation to include time-varying electric fields and how they could cause magnetic fields. Now, the addition of the term, this was called the displacement current, okay? 
This was the term that Maxwell added. The displacement current, I sub d, is defined as epsilon naught, the permittivity of free space, times the time derivative of the electric flux, d phi e dt. This term was added into Ampere's law, and now sometimes they call it the Ampere-Maxwell law. And it showed that magnetic fields are produced both by conduction currents, the enclosed currents, and by time-varying electric fields. So this new Ampere-Maxwell law is summarized here in the equation below. The integral of b dot ds is equal to mu naught times i enclosed plus mu naught times epsilon naught times d phi e dt. And of course, I could summarize that by saying that it's mu naught times i enclosed plus i displacement. Okay, so this is the new form of Ampere's law, the Ampere-Maxwell law. Now let's take this new form of the law and apply it back to our charging capacitor, just as an example of how this could be used. So if you apply this to our capacitor problem, let's take the Ampere-Maxwell law and do this. So you have the integral of B dot ds around our Ampereian loop. Our Ampereian loop I indicated here as a dashed circle that's concentric with the plates. I've indicated the plates here as circles. They don't have to be, but I've drawn them as circles here for ease of use. So here we have it, the circle um, center and the center of the plates lines up so that symmetry is obeyed, and that makes it nice. Now, b dot ds is going to be b times 2 pi r. In other words, we know that our magnetic field is going to make little loops, okay? Just because of the geometry, it's got to make little loops. And so our magnetic field is going to be parallel to our ds, which is going to walk around that loop. If you walk all the way around the loop, we're going to assume that the magnetic field is constant if I stay at the same radius. So then B dot ds integrated about that closed loop would just be B times the circumference of the circle, which is 2 pi r. Okay, so that's the left-hand side. Now on the right-hand side, it's equal to mu naught times I enclosed plus I displacement. We've already talked about how I enclosed is zero. There's no wiring there or anything. It's just a changing electric field. So I can set I enclosed equal to zero and just solve for I displacement, which is equal to epsilon naught times d phi e dt. Okay, so let's remember what electric flux is. Electric flux is E dot A, so it's the dot product with the electric field and the area vector. For our Ampereian loop, the area vector would point perpendicular to the plane of the loop in the same direction as the electric field. And so there, in this case, would be no angular dependence. The cosine of theta would go to 1, and so I could just write the electric flux is equal to Ea. Here, A would be the area of our Ampereian loop, which is pi r squared. And if I don't allow that to vary with time, which I'm not going to because that would be silly, then I can just write A is equal to pi r squared and pull it out of the time derivative. There's no time dependence there. There is, however, some time dependence in the electric field, as we've already discussed. So my displacement current becomes epsilon naught times pi r squared times d e d t. Okay, we said that the electric field was equal to sigma over epsilon naught. In this case, there's no dielectric here, she's a vacuum. So epsilon is epsilon naught here. Sigma is the charge per unit area on the plate. So I'm going to write that as q over a. However, the charge on the plate is time dependent. It's Q max, or big Q, times 1 minus E to the minus T over tau, where tau is the time constant of the R RC circuit, and tau is equal to RC. Okay? Now, that's E of T. If I take the derivative of that with respect to time D E T, then I get Q over tau A epsilon naught times E to the minus T over tau. If you need a second to take that derivative, just pause the video and make sure that you understand where that came from. Okay, moving on, I can write my displacement current as epsilon naught times pi r squared times d e d t. So that's epsilon naught times pi r over squared times q over tau a epsilon naught times e to the minus t over tau. Okay, now if you look at this, you can see that here I have pi r squared over a, so that's dimensionless, right? e to the minus t over tau is dimensionless, and that just leaves q over tau. Well, that's a charge divided by time, which is a current. So my units work out. That's nice. Okay, let's.
let's take it back to our equation for um, Ampere's law, B dot ds is equal to mu naught times I displacement. So the B dot ds part was B times 2 pi r, and then that would be equal to mu naught times I displacement, pi r squared over a, q over tau, e to the minus t over tau. Great. Now let's solve for b. I write a b of t because you can see that b is going to be dependent upon time. So b of t is equal to mu naught times r over 2a times q over tau e to the minus t over tau. All right, so let's remember that our time constant tau is equal to rc. So that makes q over tau equal to q over rc. If we solve for that, then q over c is going to be the max voltage that can happen on the capacitor plates, okay? Because Q is the max charge and C is the um, capacitance of the capacitor. So this Q over tau is equal to the max voltage divided by the resistance. So we also remember back to our equation for charging capacitors, okay? The current starts off strong and then exponentially decays. When the current starts off at its strongest, the value of that max current is the max voltage divided by R, according to Ohm's law. And then it exponentially decays, e to the minus t over tau. If you need a refresher, you can go back and watch that video on RC circuits and charging capacitors. So we know that the current with respect to time is delta V max over R, e to the minus t over tau. Well, this finally means that if I can plug everything back into that equation, here I have mu naught times R over 2A times I of T because I can plug in for the stuff with Q and tau and the exponential decay, and then that gives me the current in the circuit. So mu naught R over 2A times I of T. Now, there's a common form that these sorts of problems usually refer back to, and that is that the magnetic field in between the plates is equal to mu naught times the current I times R divided by 2 pi B squared. Now here, B is the radius of the plate, okay? R is the radial distance from the center of the plate to the point of question, and I of T is the current in the circuit. So what is this telling us? This is telling us that the magnetic field, okay, is going to change with time. It's going to exponentially decay. And this makes sense if you think about it, because once the capacitor is all charged up, the electric field doesn't change anymore, okay? And at that point, you've achieved a steady state with a strong electric field that's not changing, and if you don't have a changing electric field, then you don't have a d phi e dt. You don't have a rate of change, okay? So the, it's going to exponentially decay off, and the amount of magnetic field that you've got, it's going to get stronger the further away from the distance of radial distance from the center that you get. And that's because you're going to have more electric flux, okay? If you move farther away from the center, but still not going outside of the capacitor plates, that's going to grow as you move out because you, you've got more flux in that Ampereian loop. So that's why the dependence on R is there, okay? All right. Let's do another example problem, and it's got a slightly different spin on it, okay? Here we go. Let's read it together. A sinusoidally varying voltage is applied across the capacitor. The capacitance is 8 microfarads, and the frequency of the applied voltage is 3 kilohertz, and the voltage amplitude is 30 volts. So find the displacement current between the plates of the capacitor. So this is slightly different, right? This isn't a statically charging capacitor. We're not just hooking this up to a battery. Here we've got it hooked up to an AC source. Well, if there's an AC source, then that means that the capacitor is constantly going to be changing the amount of charge on the plates. The charge is always going to be in flux. If the charge is always in flux, then that means there's always going to be an electric field. Okay? So you're going to have an electric field that doesn't just uh, start off strong and go to zero. It's going to constantly be oscillating. Okay? All right, so how do we talk about this? Well. If you're talking about a voltage source that changes with time sinusoidally, how you would write that is that V of T, V of course for voltage and as a function of time, is going to equal to the max possible voltage times the sine of omega T. Here omega is the angular frequency. Omega is equal to 2 pi F, where F is the regular frequency as measured in hertz, okay, the number of oscillations per second. Now for our sinusoidally varying voltage, 
the max possible voltage is 30 volts, so it'll oscillate back and forth between plus 30 and minus 30, for example. So that's the coefficient that we put out front for our V naught. And then our frequency is 3 kilohertz. So omega is 2 pi times 3 kilohertz. So our function, V of t, will be 30 volts times the sine of 2 pi times 3 kilohertz times t. Okay? All right. Now this is a little different form for the displacement current than the one we derived for this the charging capacitor hooked up to a DC source. So here we go. I displacement is defined as epsilon naught times d phi e dt, where phi e is the electric flux. Okay, phi is going to be equal to e times a here. Just like before, just like this example, if we take a little snapshot in time, the area vector is going to be parallel to the electric field. So there's no cosine dependence in this particular case. And we're not going to allow our area to change, only our electric field. So we can pull the area out, and we still get epsilon naught times pi r squared, where pi r squared is the area of our little Empyrean loop here, and then times dE dt. Okay, now we don't have the electric field, but we do have the voltage. So what we can remember is that the voltage and the electric field are related to one another by delta V is equal to minus E dot dS, right? The integral of E dot dS. So here, remember that as long as the um, uh, distance in between the plates is small and we, we consider it to be close to the center, what we can do is just write that the voltage between the plates would be equal to the electric field between the plates times the spacing of the plates. So that would be that V, or delta V, would be equal to ED, okay? Here, D is the distance in between the plates. I use it as a little d here. So that means that if I want to write E, it would be the voltage between the plates divided by the distance between the plates D. All right, so instead of DE dt, I'm going to assume that the distance between the plates doesn't change. So instead of DE dt, I'm going to write 1 over D times DV dt, okay? And that will be how I relate it. Now, since I already have the expression for the voltage in between the plates, you can see where we're going with this. So, the displacement current is equal to epsilon naught times pi r squared over d times dv dt. But hey, look, this pi r squared is just the area. If I want to know what the displacement current is for the whole plate, I would just make my Ampyrean loop, for example, coincide with the size of the plate. And then that would mean that I would have epsilon naught a over d. Well, what's epsilon naught a over d? Well, it's the equation for the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor. So there you have it. So epsilon naught A over D becomes the capacitance, C. So the displacement current is just the capacitance C times dV dt. Now, V of T is given 30 volts times sine of 2 pi 3 kilohertz T. So if you take the derivative of that with respect to time, then you get dV dt is equal to 30 volts times 2 pi times 3 kilohertz times cosine of 2 pi times 3 kilohertz times T. All right, so now plug that into the displacement current, C times dV dt. Remember from the problem, C was equal to 8 microfarads. So if you plug that in, then you have out front 8 microfarads times 30 volts times 2 pi times 3,000 hertz. When you multiply all that together, you get 4.5 amps. So that means that the displacement current is equal to 4.5 amps times the cosine of 2 pi times 3 kilohertz times t. So this means that the displacement current is going to vary sinusoidally, and the max values of the current, max and min, will be plus and minus 4.5 amps. All right? Okay, I hope you understood all that and were able to follow it, and I'll see you around.